Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is Game 6 from the 2012 FIDE World Chess Championship match. Going into this round, both players have 2.5 points each, and Gelfand on the white end in this game opens with d4, Anand replying d5. Uh, d4 is a move that's uh, been seen by Gelfand in Games 2 and 4 of this match, with uh, the same reply by Anand with d5. In fact, the first five moves of this game are identical to uh, Games 2 and 4 namely c4, c6, knight c3, knight f6, e3, e6, and knight f3, a6. Things are different in this game 6 with move 6 is queen c2, a main, uh, main line watching over the e4 square. Not yet declaring this light square bishop's intentions, moving this bishop right away does allow for d takes c and these queenside pawns to come storming down. But queen c2, again, watches over e4. If there's a drawback, she's no longer around to watch over d4, and this is something that black can uh, try to uh, put pressure on, and that's the direction black does go with uh, this main line c5 move. There is also a knight b to d7, but uh, c5 does strike in the center here. It does allow for knight c6 and possibilities for maybe knight b4, exploiting the fact that the queen is on that c2 square and, and accessible to the knight. So some clarification in the center now with c takes d and e takes d and now bishop to e2 more development not going to the d3 square there might be a few reasons to avoid the d3 square so just pointing uh, those few out there is I'm not saying at this point but there is the possibility for a c4 structural change with tempo something to avoid additionally uh, the bishop is watching over the knight, so maybe there's not going to be any annoying threat of bishop takes knight down down the line here and messing up the white structure. And also, the bishop, by being on e2, stays out of the way of an eventual heavy piece uh, that can be lending support to uh, the d4 pawn. So bishop e2, bishop e6, more development on the black end, white castles, knight c6, and rook to d1. Now there are instances where we could be having, let's say, uh, structural changes. This is the first moment right here after this capture and bishop e2. This move, um, not saying it's best, but just pointing out, you know, what to do. What to do should be working with a three versus two majority now. Well, what do you do? You recognize the majority you have on the white end it's in the center, a two to one majority, and you should be looking to get your majorities rolling. So this e4 move should be springing to mind should you see this structural change. Also, even at a later point, let's just say bishop e6, castles, and even instead of the knight c6 move, should this move be played, still look into the e4 move. Same idea going on. This is where you have majority now. Additionally, there might be b3. Just looking to open up the position, seeing how black is uncastled. If b5 takes takes, again, this e4 move uh, comes up in many variations and is good. So anyhow, just pointing out uh, what things you can be doing should the structure change uh, like I just showed. So instead we have knight c6, rook d1 reinforcing the d4 pawn, and now some more clarification in the center with c takes d. One line that I was uh, a little bit interested in was in response to this rook d1 move, what if knight b4 queen b1 and queen to c8 looks a little bit uh, annoying with this bishop uh, bearing down along this diagonal and uh, from the little bit of research I did on it it seems maybe like a, a line that's uh, a bit easier for maybe black to equalize I'm not I can't be 100% sure of that but um, I've seen some crazy line I think like this with e4 D takes E and then the knight coming out to G5, it gets uh, pretty messy, but um, I think uh, things are equal or maybe even uh, slightly better for black in these complications. I can't be 100% sure, but it's definitely an, an interesting uh, line that I ended up seeing as I was reviewing this game or, or prepping to do this video. Um, but anyhow, we, we, we don't get to see this... Uh, knight b4 line instead black just going with something more concrete clarification in the center c takes d knight takes d 
this is the way to recapture with the knight. You, you don't play to the d file to end up closing it up with the pawn. Knight takes, rook takes, bishop c5, development with tempo, rook backs up. And now we have queen to e7 immediately getting out of any nonsense along the d file. Pressure on d5 with this bishop f3, and now it's, well, it's hit three times, and it's only defended twice, and black just simply ignores that pressure and castles instead. Why is this played? Why not just play that rook to d8 move and just uh, defend that pawn? Um, maybe the reason for that is looking at uh, the files on the chessboard and recognizing which ones are opened and half opened, and uh, you know, trying to come up with what are the optimal squares for the rooks to be on. Since this is the only open file, it makes sense that you're going to want to have one of your rooks there and your other rook, you know, in a position to watch over this pawn. So in other words, the rooks would like to be on c8 and d8. If you're moving this rook to d8, you can't get that uh, configuration in with your rooks. So the offering of a pawn black castles and white goes for it, grabbing on d5 after bishop takes bishop takes knight takes rook takes uh, the position has simplified quite a bit but white is now up a pawn but also down uh, some development here the queen side still needing to uh, get rolling here rook c8 is already threatening to win that pawn back with the discovered attack on the queen and in the game, we saw uh, white just running with bishop d2, which uh, does allow for bishop takes e3. But just pointing out what might occur should white sidestep this uh, discovered attack on the queen with queen to e2, we could have queen to f6. And this is still very difficult for white to finish the queen side development. The queen is very active from f6. By still keeping an eye on b2, you're stopping bishop to d2 and running just with uh, one variation here let's say e4 preparing to get this bishop outside uh, this diagonal right here um, you, you can't go too far one you know f4 is covered if you go to e3 well in fact after rook f to e8 there is no bishop to e3 because of the pressure on e4 so let, let's just run with this line after e4 let's just say rook f to e8, putting pressure on e, and there's already um, the possibility for taking on e4, just making a passing move. We already have this threat right here. The queen is overworked, having to watch over e4 and f2. You take the rook, it's a mate in two. So um, what we could have is, let's say, e5, queen c6, and uh, with this rook being hit, let's say it's now defended. f6 is a way to open up the position uh, again, at a moment where these guys are still uh, on their home squares, uh, the pawn can't be captured because we have mate happening. And if the pawn on e5 is reinforced, there's uh, an interesting shot that could come about after f takes e, bishop takes e. Again, an interesting shot would be bishop takes on f2. What do you do? The queen can't take, otherwise the rook falls. And if king takes rook, or excuse me, king takes bishop, there's rook to f8 getting uh, this pin going on and if the bishop backs up again we have another instance here where the queen would be overworked having to watch over both rook and bishop we could have rook takes queen takes and queen takes rook so just just showing um, how black has compensation how they can be putting pressure um, in uh, these positions here with these uh, pieces still not contributing in any way it's very difficult uh, to really hang on to that pawn and get developed. That's the main thing. So we don't have that. Instead of uh, the queen just sidestepping this discovered attack, she stays there for just one moment. Bishop d2 instead. It does allow for bishop takes e. That is what is played. And now bishop c3. So the pawn has been given back a typical idea just to finish development and after all that, white does still stand slightly better, seeing how this bishop is better placed than uh, black's bishop. So coming back, bishop b6, probably the best square, staying off of an open file. And now queen to f5, queen improvement. Recognizing that this queen is in a strong pot, we 
strong spot, excuse me, queen to e6, offering a queen exchange, and if there is this exchange going on, okay, this is an isolated pawn, but so what, there's pressure now against uh, f2, and this is uh, dwindling down to another very, very calm uh, position. We do not have that. We do not have the queens coming off the board. The queen does retreat, and now we have f6, uh, so that this bishop is not having a, a direct sight of the g7 square. And uh, also, it, it is allowing for uh, king to f7 to occur, but not for as long as the, the queens are on the board. It's more of a case, uh, as soon as the queens come off the board, then the king is going to be playing to f7. It's more of a just shutting down this uh, dark square bishop for right now. H4, it's a flight square and maybe possibilities for getting this pawn involved, but uh, there's not really uh, too much more going on since we do have um, identical pawn structures, three versus three, two versus two, and uh, everything else is now balanced. H5, rook F to D8, we have a pair of rooks coming off, the queens come off, and there's some structural damage, but uh, in such a simplified position, there's not really a way to take advantage of that. So just uh, finishing up, the, the white rook does get in, involved on the e-file. The king now plays a role, getting towards the center. g4, and this is the last, uh, the last uh, phase of the game, basically. Just recognizing uh, how strong this bishop is, or how this bishop right here on c3 is better placed than this guy. Let's exchange them off, and that's what black does. Bishop d4, there's no pin because of bishop takes on f2, and then the rook would fall. So just rook c1, anticipating the bishop's exchange. The rook wants to be in a spot to eye these uh, pawns over here, namely that uh, c6 pawn. Bishop takes, rook takes, and after rook to d4, we have uh, Anand, uh, or excuse me, Gelfand and Anand once again uh, shaking hands because there's not really a whole lot to do. There's pressure on g4. Um, this is just a drawn position. This is where they shake hands. But you know, if I were to follow up, I mean, what do you what do you really do? There's f3. There's a rook that could give check. King f2. Rook check. King e3. Okay, black just won a pawn, but that pawn will be won back. And notice that uh, this king has made uh, significant progress towards the center of the board while that rook was on its way to capturing the b2 pawn. Uh, as a follow up here, we could be seeing rook a3, and it's a very uncomfortable spot for this rook to now be in, to have to watch over the a-pawn. And soon enough, we could be having king d4, king c5, and this rook gets chased away. And that pawn will be won back, even if it turned out to be a situation where um, black was, or excuse me, white was somehow up a pawn in these rook and pawn endgames. It's uh, very difficult to uh, show uh, a winning continuation. So uh, as it was in this game after... Uh, this rook to d4 move. Again, both of these guys uh, agree to a draw. So that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.